Shall I see? You know how I feel. River running free. You know how I feel. Blossom on the tree. You know how I feel. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Dragon fly out in the sun. You know what I mean, don't you know? That was Michael Bublé with Feeling Good. Well, it is Christmas after all. Welcome to British Audio File. And in this episode, which is going to be the last episode of this year, for this decade for that matter, I've been reflecting on what has changed in hi-fi over the last 10 years and what hasn't changed. And with that in mind, I'm going to discuss why I believe the Chord Mojo is perhaps the most important product that has been produced over the last 10 years and why I believe there should be a desktop version of it. So what has changed over the last 10 years? Well, there's been massive changes in terms of the way in which we consume music. Vinyl has had a resurgence to some extent. There's been a huge decline in terms of the number of CDs sold. The vast majority of people, if they are listening to digital media, are using their phones and some kind of streaming service. And uh, there's been an increase in headphone use whilst there's been a decline in traditional hi-fi. And it's tough for ma hi-fi manufacturers out there, I get it. There's so much more tech that they're competing with. When I was growing up 30 years ago, most people had a TV and a half-decent hi-fi system in their home, and that was about it. But these days, there's so much more that potentially people may be interested in. And the vast majority of people out there are quite happy with a decent pair of in-ear monitors or headphones plugged into their phone and a sound bar, perhaps at best, for TV uh, reproduction and home theatre. So hi-fi manufacturers either have to go um, high volume, small margin, and that part of the industry has never been uh, uh, better in terms of what you get for your money if you're spending a couple of hundred pounds on a pair of speakers or an amplifier or they go very high margin and very low volume, and that's great for the one percenters, but what for the rest of us out there? I don't think everything is lost. I think there's a significant proportion of people out there who are interested in having a quality music uh, reproduction system in their home, as long as it's convenient, as long as it fits into their living rooms, into their lifestyles for that matter, and as long as it's affordable. And I think active speakers are a massive step in the right direction. And I'm talking about things like the Kef LS50 wireless that has built-in amplification, has built-in DAX, has a streaming module. But that's a £2,000 solution. And I can't in honesty recommend that to anything but audiophiles and people who are relatively well healed who think £2,000 isn't a significant amount of outlay. So... I've recommended to people think, uh, the name Muso, which is a one box kind of sound base, if you like, um, which retails for £900. And people have been delighted with the performance of that. But really, as good as that is, and there's nothing against the Muso, is that the best the industry can offer for £900 in this day and age? I think we could do a lot better. And I think things are changing. Manufacturers are waking up to this, but things have moved very slowly. So in this up and coming decade, I'd like to see a whole plethora of really good quality monitor speakers, active monitor speakers for inside a thousand pounds and their equivalent active uh, floor standing models for inside 1500 pounds. And I think that genuinely will happen. And I'd like to see them with built-in amplification, but off-board DAX and streaming modules and for very good reasons. It's all to do with how mature a technology is. Speaker technology, amplifier technology, turntable technology hasn't changed hardly at all over the last decade. Very little over the last two or three decades there's been developments in terms of materials and you know more precision in terms of electronics 
but essentially the designs are very similar. And in testimony of that, I can point you towards my Proact Response One SEs. I put those up against any monitor speaker at £2,000 today. And right next to me here, I have Celestrion 300s, which are perhaps about 25, 30 years old. And again, I'd put those up against any floor standing speaker for around £2,000 and they'll favour very well. There's an up and coming review coming up on my Technics SE M100, which is a 30 year old Technics amplifier. And that again, would favour very well with uh, its modern equivalents. That is not the case with digital technology. This Cord Mojo DAC normally retails for £400, is currently on sale for £300. Now this will outperform any DAC, not from 30 years ago, not from 10 years ago, but from five years ago that perhaps retailed for two or three thousand pounds. That's how significantly technology has moved on in the last five years. And this is not the finished article by any means. There's still a number of prob problems with digital to analog conversion. If you want to know why Cord DACs sound particularly good, look at my review of the Cord Mojo, which uh, you can look up on my channel. But that's just one aspect. I talk about the interpolation filter in that review. There's things with noise shaping. There's the interface on these DACs uh, with regards to a multiplex signal, whether you use the SPDIF on the coax or the uh, TOSLINK or the USB interface. There's problems there. There's all kinds of artifacts that are created from post ringing to pre ringing. If you try and get the frequency response flat, you play havoc with the phase response. If you try and get the phase response right, you play havoc with the frequency response. These are all solutions that can be and will be um, found out in coming years, which will make, cause massive improvements in DAX. And that's why I personally wouldn't invest a huge amount of money in a DAC unless you do it with the intention of knowing that in five years time, you're going to wind up having to replace it with something else. Okay, deep breath, rant over. What I'm trying to say is that active speakers are a great way to go. If this industry is to survive and to grow, they need to really embrace that. And there needs to be an awful lot more of those type of solutions available. And I'm sure there will be in the future, but keep all the mature, um, analog technology inside the box and the evolving digital technology outside the box, even if you package it all together. That way, a few years down the line, you don't have to change your speakers, you don't have to change your amplifier, you just change the front end of your system. Don't worry for us tinkerers out there, I'm sure there's still going to be a number of passive solutions. That brings me on nicely as to why I think the Cord Mojo has been one of the most significant products over the last 10 years and why I think there should be a desktop version of it. Now this is an FPGA DAC that currently retails for £300. There's other FPGA DACs out there. PS Audio do one called the Direct Stream, which I think is circa four to £5,000 DCS. Uh, Bartok, I think, is their entry level at around £10,000. Cord themselves have um, other DACs in their range using the FPGA technology. I think the next one up from this is £1,200, but this is an FPGA DAC that currently retails for £300. Now, I should point out that FPGA technology in itself is no guarantee of quality, but in the right hands, and in this case, Rob Watt's hands, that extra horsepower, that DSP, massive DSP engine that he has available in the FPGA chip, allows to deal with a lot of those digital nasties to some extent that I spoke about earlier in this video. And that's why this FPGA TAC at £300 represents such a significant move forward in terms of digital audio and sound reproduction. So why should there be a desktop version of this Cord Mojo? Well, as the name suggests, Mojo stands for Mobile Joy. Cord developed this DAC for the headphone market and they've done very well out of it. They've sold bucket loads of this, but in the process, I think they've sold this DAC short. A number of audiophiles and hi-fi enthusiasts quite rightly use this DAC as the main DAC in their system. 
And in the spirit of this egalitarian approach to hi-fi that I spoke about as we enter this new decade, I think it's really important that we have affordable digital products at the forefront of what can be done in terms of technology that we can invest in, knowing that we're going to get a good return on that investment over four or five years and then have to upgrade it for a newer version. I'm quite comfortable recommending to people to spend as much money as they want on speakers and amplifiers, knowing that they're going to have them potentially for a lifetime. I'm less comfortable giving that same advice for digital products that I know are going to need replacing four or five years down the line. I could just use this DAC. Do I really need a desktop solution? Yeah, I do, I'm afraid. This, quite frankly, is a pain in the backside to live with as a desktop DAC. If I can just show you on this side, these are the three and a half mil audio outputs, uh, connecting any decent quality cable here and here places quite a lot of stress on uh, these joints. And I think that's going to cause problems in time. Flipping it over on the other side, you've got your digital inputs, optical, that's your power connection, that's your micro USB and your micro coaxial input. And uh, they're all fine, but uh, the reality is there's no input selection on this DAC. So um, if you want to listen to one over the other, you have to unplug the others. And so I'm forever disconnecting the coax and plugging in the micro USB or unplugging that to plug in the optical, depending on which input I want to use for what application. Um, it'd be really nice to also have a remote control. So this could effectively become a fully fledged DAC preamp with uh, that kind of convenience. And I'd also like to have a choice of digital filters because I know that Rob Watts colored, tailored the sound of this DAC to suit the headphones that this was likely to be used with in its marketplace. So four or 500 pound headphones, most of those relatively have a bright uh, sound and he deliberately tailored the sound on this DAC to be slightly warmer and softer and I'd like to have the option as you do with other chord DACs of having a different digital filter to tailor the sound to suit my system. So I've even come up with a name for this. Uh, this is mobile one was called the Mojo and I think the desktop operational one should be called the Dojo. So if you agree with me and you think they're should be a Chord Dojo. I think they can use the same chassis and probably produce something given the fact that they don't need the battery and they probably have to add in those extra features for a similar price, perhaps it may creep up a touch more. But if you agree with me, um, please say so in the comments. And if I get enough of these kind of comments and enough views, I'm prepared to speak to Colin Pratt, who's the sales director at Chord and that's the kind of direct action perhaps that we should be taking in this new approaching decade to have this kind of, as I say, egalitarian approach to hi-fi. I'm prepared to speak to him if we get enough views and enough likes um, and talk to him about whether they would consider taking on this project to have a desktop version of the Chord Mojo. So thumbs up, please, if you'd like for the Chord Dojo. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If so, please hit the like and consider sharing this video. It really helps me out in terms of growing this channel. It has been growing steadily and nicely over the last few weeks. So um, onwards and upwards for 2020. Uh, if you like my approach to hi-fi and um, you've seen a couple of my other videos, please, please consider subscribing. And um, all that remains for me to say is happy holidays. Wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. And I'll see you in the next year and the next decade. But for today, for now, the British Audiophile signing off.